What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Toolkit. I'm Jordan Bud, and today we have a super cool guest, Evan Simbita of Simbita Custom Knives. He is out in the east. He does custom knife work with a bunch of different kinds of steels, um, different designs, different handle options, and completely custom. So uh, I had him on on the Rockcast quite a while back. I think that you can dig into Rockslide and find the the uh, archives, and you can dig up that episode if you want. Um, but we're going to talk with him again today. I thought he'd be a, an awesome guest to have on. We're going to discuss uh, like ergonomics of knives. You know, choosing the right knife for the job. Um, what he you know really likes as far as backcountry knives versus uh, front country knives. We also dig in a little bit on replaceable blade knives and why why each of us don't really like them. Kind of the evolution. Everybody was using those uh, replaceable blade knives, and now it seems like everybody's kind of going back over to fixed blade options. So that's really interesting. Uh, we're going to talk about different kinds of steel options that you have, some of the pluses and minuses of all of those, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about sharpening as well. So... Real quick, I got a question on Instagram uh, this morning that related to knives, so I thought that it was kind of inter- interesting. What do you use for a knife sharpener? And he says, thanks and cheers from Alberta. So this relates right to this episode. So I like this sharpener right here. It, whoops, this way. And it's backwards because the the camera makes it backwards. Um, But it's the guided field sharpener from Worksharp Sharpeners. Um, The thing I really like about it is it has uh, like it has your knife guides. Um, So it has a guide here. It says twenty degree guide. So it you can lay your knife on the side of it. Let's see here. You can lay your knife on the side of it. It would give you that angle guide, and it has. has kind of a rougher diamond on one side and a fine diamond on the other. And then it has a ceramic portion here on the top. It has your ceramic and then here it has a leather strop. So um, really lightweight, really pretty small. Um, I won't always take this thing with me like in my pack out in the field, but uh, I will have it in the vehicle all the time. So if we get back and I can touch it up or if I'm bored, sometimes I'll just sharpen and we'll touch it up. Um, so yeah, this is, they're pretty dang cheap and they're small and they're just nice to have around. So that's, that's what I like to use. Uh, so without anything, I guess, left to cover, we are going to dive right in with Evan. All right, we are back with Evan Simbita of Simbita Custom Knives. Dude, I haven't talked to you in, like, years. I think the last time we talked, you were getting ready to go full-time with the shop, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. it's been a minute. Yeah, yeah, it's been a minute, but things have changed a lot. <laughs> All for yeah. the better. But, yeah, I'm full-time, and I don't have a side hustle or anything right now. It's just it making so knives. fun. It's been awesome. We were talking a little pre-recording about how nice it is having your own business. Like, there are some downsides definitely but like we were talking about how nice it is to be able to have some freedoms to be able to go like when you have to be home you have to be there and working but it lets you go do other things that normally like you would have to approve time off for months in advance oh yeah like when i worked at the factory job i used to have like you'd have to get permission i felt like i was a kid you know living with my parents i'd ask permission anytime i wanted to do anything and now like i said before we started recording like I'd be a terrible employee at this point. Like I'm so used to the freedom. It's insane. (laughs) I want to do something. I just do it. You know, like I've had times where I've worked all week and then all weekend and then all the next week and then taken like two weeks off. And then I've had times where I've woken up sick and I'm like, I'm sick. I'm just going to work Saturday. Like no approval needed. Just do what needs to be done. And uh, it's been working. It's been pretty cool. Yeah. It's so, yeah, it's so nice. I couldn't imagine going back either. It'd be awful. Um, but yeah, anyways, we're going to, we're going to talk about knives. So what's like, what's new in the, in the custom? Are you still just doing like all made to order or are you still, uh, before you were doing like 
you would make kind of a cool knife and then you would just put it up for sale on Instagram. Are you still doing that? Well, I'm doing a little bit of both. And then I've got a third option I just added in. So about 75% of what I do is custom order. So I've got a wait list and that's about eight months out right now to get a custom order. And then um, I do every week, just about every week, I do what I call open sale knives, which is what you're describing. I do something mm -hmm. that just sounds like fun and I put it up for sale. And then, and that might be like, it might be anywhere on the spectrum from mild to wild. It might be, you know, a budget build. It might be really expensive. Um, just whatever I feel like using that week. And then I occasionally do, well, now it's tr I'm trying to do it every week now, what I call a stock knife. And I have two different models that are my most popular models. And I'm just doing, they're all exactly the same. So they're all in my stock standard option steel. They're all in olive drab G10 with carbon fiber pins and a black sheath. And the idea is if I make two or three every single week, if I have a customer call in and say, hey, I know it's last second, but I've got a mule deer hunt next week. Can I buy something? Well, you can get this. Yeah. And it uh, gives you a good feel for what my stuff is like. And then if you like it a lot, which I hope you do, come back and buy a custom next year. Perfect. Yeah, dude, that's a great idea. Um, so yeah, I just, I wanted to walk through a little bit on like what we covered last time. So I had you back on the rock cast when I was hosting that. And I thought like we had such a, a cool conversation about knives and I listened back to it a couple days ago. And one thing that was kind of cool, I thought that, st that stuck out to me was you were talking about how knives are like, you know, people put so much emphasis and time and money into other portions of gear. And it seems like people are starting to do that with their, their knives. And I think even more so now, like replaceable blade knives used to be the thing. Like everybody was, you know, different companies were trying to make different handles for the blades and all this stuff. And now it seems like it's starting to shift back over towards a good fixed blade. And have you seen that shift? Big time. Like it's, it's interesting because whenever I started, this is like a hobby. That's like you're saying, like there was a few people that used fixed blades, but none of them used custom work. None of them used uh semi like small production shop stuff there was always like a buck or case a little bit of bench made and then it was if it wasn't one of those it was a replaceable blade knife and yeah everybody likes how well they cut until they lose a blade in the gut cavity <laughs> or or break one and you know have to deal with that you know in the cold when your fingers don't work right and yeah you know i've, I've seen a heavy shift towards fixed blades again yeah it's it's so interesting what are your what are your thoughts on just replaceable blades like in general? You just touched on one problem with them breaking the tips out. I've had I've broken tips and had them fly back towards me. Yeah, I, I'm not a big fan. I totally see their benefits. Um, like I've got a buddy who's a taxidermist and he uses a scalpel all the time when he's doing you know like skinning out heads and stuff like mm -hmm. that. But I mean, even he'll tell you like it's not as effective in my opinion and his opinion too it's not as effective as a fixed blade for, uh, yeah. for skinning. It's just so much like faster. Um, it's more effective. It's more ergonomic to use a fixed blade whenever you're skinning. And that's what we're doing in the field is we're breaking down animals. We're not skinning faces out. I mean, you can cape your animal in the field too, but that's like 5% of the job. Like right. the other 95% is deboning, skinning, you know, working on bone joints, separating yeah, bone breaking joints. Knuckles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And like you said, the ergos, just having a better handle and something to, you know, everybody for a while, like with the replaceable blade kind of movement, I guess, if you will, it, people wanted to go to really lightweight, like skeletonized handles. And those things were hard to hang on to, especially you get like all gristly and fat and stuff on your hands. And it's like, they're, it's tough to hang on to. So, yeah, well, like the selling point was always how light they are. Like, oh, look at this, yeah. like this, the knife, including the sheath is like 1.2 ounces. And then all the people that would get them would get them and then they would stuff stuff into the skeletonized holes and then wrap it in paracord. So they had this bigger, yeah. bulkier handle and they're like, oh, it's great now. And it's like, now it weighs three ounces. You just totally undid everything that you said you wanted to right. buy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And then it went from that to like, all right, I'm going to take a replaceable blade and I'm going to take a fixed blade. Like I was on that for a while. <laughs> I'll admit. Yeah. Yeah. So... Yeah, super like, interesting. Like a lot of a lot of folks, a lot of folks. It, it, 
I've noticed a lot over the last couple of years have said, well, yeah, I like the idea of a fixed blade, but I don't want to sharpen my stuff in the field. So that's why I take replaceable blades. And I think most people don't realize just how good some steels can be. And oh, I think most yeah. folks, their experience, yeah, most folks experience is like buck or case. And I'm not crapping on buck or case, but those are like consumer grade steels. They're very, very low quality when it comes to like how they score on edge retention and things like that, that everything they care about with, with case and buck with the majority of their stuff is how economically can we produce it? And is it going to rust whenever somebody puts it through the dishwasher? That's all they care about. And some of the new steels we have now, like Magna cut, it's absurd. The edge retention that you can get out of them. Yeah. I want to, I want to talk about that too. And we're going to dig. Yeah. We're going to dig in all that stuff is so, I don't know. It's so interesting. Um, but one question I wanted, I wanted to lead with, with you is like, what's the most, annoying email you get about knives <laughs> just like, oh guaranteed ha- hands down my favorite question is what do your knives cost and i'm yeah. like that's like the most blanket question in the world like you wouldn't go to a car dealer and be like what's a vehicle cost like what do you want like you said before do you want right. an f-150 do you want a ferrari do you want a smart car like what are your goals and uh like, then I have to respond with that. And then they say, I, well, I just want a price list. And I'm like, so I got to get break down all 30 yeah. some of my models. I actually lost count where I'm at. Um, I'm always putting on new stuff and, uh, and, you know, being custom, like you can't just give a price for a model. There's a price for the model where it starts and then where it might top out. But then if you have a customer that has really right. extravagant taste that can bump up even more. So it's eh, just the, the broad question of how much something costs. It's like, ah. And yeah. it's not anybody's fault. It's usually it's somebody's first custom knife. So, right. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah, I can understand it, but I think the problem with just price shopping on stuff like that is you're going to end up buying a knife off of price and it's not going to be like the night, the, the, the better option for the application that you're using it in. Like I, I remember oh, last yeah. time. Yeah. I remember last time we talked, we were talking about, I think blade, we were just talking about knives in general, how big, some of them can be and like doing the outfitting and stuff. Like I've gotten people that have huge knives, like huge blades that I've used to like try to gut something. And it's hard to like, that is not the knife for that job. I don't think just, you know, like legit six inch plus blades. And it's, it's just too much. And like really big bulky handles trying to move in and out of places. It's just rough rough to work those things oh yeah like everybody always asks me what i like in the the back country and like my stuff's little the stuff i prefer yeah you know personally you know little tiny guys six and a half inches overall two and three quarter inch blade and most most folks want something like gigantic and it's like right. that's just you can do it but it's like that's not what you want we're not cutting steaks and stuff in the field we're skinning you know yeah 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 for sure. So can we dive into that a little more, like choosing the right knife for the job? And another thing too is I, I'm i a big fan, especially a lot of folks I feel like that are watching this or like just getting into it or just trying to go, you know, up and in, in like just make their gear a little better. And like most people can't buy two, right? Um, or mm-hmm. at least right off the bat. So like I'm a big proponent and like what is one really kind of do it all design in your mind to make it like, if you're just going to buy one to do pretty much everything, what would that look like? Well, if you're going to do like one for everything and you're, you're, you're making compromises at that point. Yep. Right. So you're not going ultra light. You're not going super heavy. You're kind of going in the middle. Um, that'd be something like this, which is my magpie model. And it's about a little over eight inches long, about eight and a half inches long with a three and a half inch blade. It's not the lightest knife. It's extremely ergonomic. Um, I think that's probably my most ergonomic handle when it comes to stuff for breaking down animals. And um, in fact, I skin deer for a deer processor whenever I have free time. And uh, that's the knife I reach for every time. And I'm talking like 20, 25 deer a day, you know, skinning. Yeah. And, you know, that's the knife I want. But it it does leave some stuff at the table. You know, it's a little bit small for... Um, you know, if you're going to be doing breaking down stuff in the kitchen when you get back and it's a little bit big for, you know, I mean, it's not too big to do it, but it's a little heavy 
whenever you're packing as light as you can to go up above the tree line. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, so what should people, what should people like have an internal conversation with themselves about when they're going to look at something like, you know, there's like, you're getting ready to go to Idaho on a hunt. That'll probably be a back country. Like, uh, so you're thinking about that. Some folks are just thinking about, Hey, I just want, you know, a knife to gut a white tail or a mule deer in the field. And then I'm taking my deer to the processor. So I don't really have to worry about anything after that. Can you talk about like those two things and what you would start thinking about as far as choosing a knife for both those applications? Yeah. Well, so for like the front country hunter, um, which most of us are, uh, Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd I'd mostly think about ergonomics and um, a a knife blade shape that lends its well to skinning without poking into the guts. Um, I know everybody likes gut hooks, but with a properly shaped blade, you really don't need a gut hook. And it's just something that's a pain to sharpen. Um, That night, that same knife I was showing the magpie, um, that's kind of what I would recommend for the front country guy. But I'll let let the camera, there we go. My window's really small, so I'm probably exaggerating. Um, But I've got a graceful curve. It's real subtle, but it's just enough that I'm not poking into the guts when I'm zipping up through a deer. And uh, it's also got an aggressive enough tip to work around fine areas while having enough belly to to get everything else done. And um, that's kind of what I want with a knife, at least me personally. Mm -hmm. Um, I want something that I can work on an animal and be effective, be nimble, be quick at the same time. It's, uh, it's not going to be uncomfortable and Mm -hmm. that's kind of a tough combination. Sometimes I think most folks reach for blades that are real deep in the belly and they have a real big blunt nose. And uh, that just makes it really difficult to work around tight areas like the elbow joints and ankles and things like that on deer. Um, because at the end of the day, that's what we're doing. Especially if you take your animal to a processor, you're just skinning in the field. So, right. uh, Um, would that be like a drop point? Yeah, it's, uh, it's technically a drop point, I guess it's not, it's real gradual. I mean, if you like the line, the curvature of the handle just keeps going until it gets the tip, but it doesn't drop aggressively like a lot of knives, um, knives that drop really aggressively when you turn it upside down and you work up the animal, um, just like a zipper, Mm -hmm. um, that initial cut, it ends up forcing you to hold the knife at a really steep angle to ride that tip. And it makes it really difficult. You end up like slipping and making cuts like that. But with this, I can run it down at a shallow angle and just one long cut up the animal. In fact, on my Instagram, I have a video um, in the processing shop. Um, Basically, I think it's called why I don't like gut hooks. And I show (laughs) I I zip down an entire leg on this big buck in one cut, explaining that, you know, you don't need a gut hook. And here's proof zip. And with the right angle, it's literally one cut. Um, I think most folks get too caught up in either the gut hook and they end up with too blunt of a blade because of that. Yeah. Or they get caught up in having those really big bellies because they're worried about poking stuff. Um, it just slows you down though. Yeah. And then like you were talking about, you can go too far that way, but then you can go too far the other direction too of like, is it called a clip point where they, it's like really narrow and then that's too pokey, right? Like that, that will clip your guts. Yeah. And that makes it really difficult. I've got a buddy who he, he likes skinning with the boning knife and which is not far off from a fillet knife. It's real pokey like that. And I mean, for him it works, but I feel like I've, like I've watched him skin with it. He does a good job, but it slows him down because he's always working to try to keep that tip from going down into the guts and, Mm -hmm. you know, cutting open a stomach or something like that. What about the like steels? There are a ton of different kinds of steels. And I think that that's where people kind of lose it sometimes is they don't even really understand or realize that there are all these different kinds of steels that are going in to these knives. It's just not like one is the same as the rest. Yeah. Well, so steels, it's uh, that's like one of my favorite topics in knives. Yeah. There's a lot of parallels between knives and guns, and I'm a big gun guy, right? Like, I love rifles, rifle cartridges. I, like, geek out on ballistics. And um, so, like, a knife steel is more than just, like, how long is it going to stay sharp? Um, I compare the steel alloy to picking a cartridge for your rifle. Um, It doesn't mean anything is a bad choice or a good choice, but there are certain applications that are better than others. And just like cartridges, there's ideal bullet weights and, you know, loadings. There's ideal sharpening angles and sharpening methods. 
and uh, it's it's like a whole rabbit hole. But to make things simple, I have three <clears throat> steels that I use, and they're my favorite steels. Like I don't offer anything that's like not my favorite, you know. Mm-hmm. Like, um, but I try to stick with what we call balanced steels, and that's mm-hmm. being balanced is like there's three different attributes of a knife steel: there's strength, there's edge retention, and there's corrosion resistance. And a balanced steel has all three of those sort of in tandem. You're not giving one up to get the other two high up okay. on the scale. And um, a lot of the steels you see, like, you know, Benchmade, for example, has stuff in S110V. Crazy steel. It'll hold an edge mm-hmm. for, like, the rest of your life. A little bit exaggerating, but it's not strong at all. Like, you can't do anything even slightly rough with it. It'll break. Um, and it's not as corrosion resistant as some other stuff. And there are other steels that are super focused on corrosion resistance. Like I mentioned with uh, a lot of cheaper production knives, like in 420 and 440. Mm-hmm. And those, like, they're almost impossible to make rust, but they won't hold an edge for crap. And uh, so the steels I work with, I prefer to have something that has all three of those attributes. Um, You know, they're not giving anything up. They're really well balanced. Um, But there's a lot of good steels out there. I mean, like, the three I use aren't the only ones on the market, obviously. But I prefer one called AEBL. It's all letters. I don't actually pretend to know why it's called that yeah um but it's a european stainless steel and it's super fine grained easy to sharpen takes a screaming edge with like very little effort and it's really strong you're not going to break it whenever you're like working into the ball and socket joint on a hip uh, trying to break that tendon that holds them together you're not going to break the tip off um the downside is it's not like rust proof it's it's corrosion resistant it's a stainless steel but it's not rust proof and you're you're going to get through like maybe an elk elk and a half before you have to touch the edge up the edge retention isn't insane um the other one is magna cut and i mentioned that before um stuff's pretty insane it's uh the edge retention is stellar it's nearly impossible to make rust and it's still really strong it's just more expensive a little harder to sharpen yeah so is that kind of in a league of its own that magna cut yeah, I mean, there are, like I mentioned, there are other steels that hold an edge longer, but not with all the attributes that Magna Cut has. Uh, for reference, like I mentioned, I skin deer for a processor, buddy. Yeah. It gives me an excuse to try out new heat treat recipes, new blade shapes, all that stuff. And when Magna Cut first came on the scene, I said, okay, I'm going to see how far I can push this before I need to sharpen it. And most people think I'm nuts, but I did 54 deer on one edge. Never Dude. sharpened. That's yeah, wild. it was insane. Now, like, full disclaimer, I ran it across a smooth, like, non-abrasive steel just to take out rolls because I was doing awful things with it. I was splitting rib cages. <laughs> I was cutting out butts. I was uh, separating elbow and knee joints. I was taking, I was popping vertebrae on does. Um, I was doing terrible stuff. I just wanted to see what it took to make it stop working. But 54 deer. So, and that's while being rust-proof or nearly rust-proof. And um, also being stronger than most stainless steels. Mm-hmm. So that it's, it's pretty incredible stuff. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so there's, I was looking at just a few companies that had knives um, and the way that they were listing them, you know, they were talking about your stainless steels, like you were just talking about. And then they also mm-hmm. mentioned ba- uh, ball bearing steels, and then they'll call it a tool steel. Can you yeah. kind of run through those? Yeah, so well, tool steel is kind of like a catch-all. Um, tool steel is any steel that has a high enough carbon content to be hardenable to a workable hardness. And that doesn't necessarily mean a hardness that you can make a knife with. Some tool steels need to just be able to take impact. And they, they're really good at taking impact, but they're not good at holding an edge because that's not what the steel is designed for. And there are some steels, uh, like 4140 is an example. Um, that's a tool steel and it's, it's on the edge of what we would call a tool steel. We make rifle barrels out of it, but you don't see knives made out of them. Um, it's Got a it. relatively malleable steel and, you know, that gives the ability to be just obliterated with pressure, like in a rifle and, uh, not shatter, but mm-hmm. it's not going to make a good knife. Um, we have other steels like a two O one ten ninety five. A lot of these steels you see uh, on the shelves offered by knife makers and they mm-hmm. weren't made for knives. Those deals were actually made for making tool and die stuff for making car parts um, in the forties and fifties. And we still use them. Somebody figured out they were good for making knives and now we use them a lot. Um, ball bearing steels are similar. They tend to have different traits. Uh, they're, they're, they're zeroed in on different traits. And the idea is that they can take a lot of pressure without cracking. 
So you think about a ball bearing, um, you have a round ball and then you're putting all the force you have on one tiny little focus point because it's round. It needs to be able to handle that without shattering or cracking or breaking apart. And okay. uh, those tend to make good knives with appropriate heat treats. Um, they're messy to work with. They're not as clean to work with as air hardening steels. Um, but they tend to make a really tough knife. Yeah, I was using one the other day that had had a ball bearing steel in it, and it seemed like edge retention wasn't what I thought it was going to be. Like pretty much skinning one elk, and I was like, and just a just a not even actually the whole elk, just a doing a oh what do you call it? Just a shoulder mount, just a yeah to you know a regular shoulder mount. And uh, I was touching that thing up again quite a bit at the end. I was basically just resharpening it there when I got done with that cape. But so that was kind of interesting. And then I started looking at different, um, like, you know, folks that are like doing the stainless steels. And yeah, it just, it's such a, there are a ton of different kinds of steels. Like it's harder to keep up with than calibers. (laughs) There's hundreds of different kinds of steels. It's insane. Yeah. Um, I've got a book uh, by a guy named Laren Thomas, and it's Knife, Steels, and Engineering. I might be quoting the name wrong, but it's about you know heat treating and mechanics of knife geometry and things like that. And mm-hmm. he's got just a, a short rundown of basic, you know, like a bunch of seals that are popular. And the list looks like Barnes's uh, you know book, Cartridges of the World. It's yeah. insane. And that's like not even a fraction of what there is out there. And they're making new steels every day. Yeah, so you can definitely see how it can be confusing like you pop on a website to look at a knife and you see what it's made out of and you're like there's four numbers after a ball bearing steel and you're like what does that even mean Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. it 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 gets it gets confusing that's like one of the reasons i only offer a couple different steels i I offer Mm -hmm. steels that work well for everybody and that i also like have a ton of experience with um and you know that's somebody calls me and they want a knife we attend to talk about you know, that at some point in the conversation mm-hmm. about steels. And um, the biggest thing is find somebody that knows their stuff about steels and ask them, you know, like, don't yeah. just go on Google and type in like, you know, what do you think about this steel and go to a message board? Because most people on message boards are talking out their backside. They mm-hmm. have no idea what they're talking about. Um, and I mean, a good steel with a poor heat treat is still a terrible steel. Like it's, it's, it's not going to cut well. Like you have to have like, you know, all of that stuff, good geometry, a good heat treat combined with a good steel and yeah how would you know about heat treat is that more of like a brand type type thing where you like that's why you go with a brand you trust because they have a good Uh, heat treat yeah like you can't look at a knife and tell that it's been heat treated Mm -hmm. properly um it's kind of well another rifle analogy like if you have a rifle that has a like a way off from square bolt face and um I mean, maybe that the trigger is like a non-consistent trigger, the action, like it hasn't been inlaid to the stock well, it's not bedded, it might look great right off the shelf, and then it's going to shoot terrible, and you're going to have to like go through this huge checklist to figure out what's wrong with it. Um, a knife can look absolutely amazing and then be made with terrible steel or made with yeah. good steel with a bad heat treat. Uh, the biggest thing is to go to a reputable uh, maker, especially with a lot of these small batch steels like MagnaCut. Um, they're getting to be more mainstream, but I would make sure that you get something from somebody I'm going to totally, you know, prop myself up here. Somebody like yeah. me, because yeah. if you buy something for me and like, I'm not perfect, I totally screw up sometimes. You get a knife for me and you're like, hey, you said this would last like 20 or 30 deer. Um, I needed to sharp after one. I'm going to be like, hey, send it back. I will either double check it and make sure it's not something you did. Um, maybe you're just like cutting into teeth like crazy when you're skinning mm-hmm. that head. Or maybe I screwed up, in which case I'll make you a new knife. Like I warrant my stuff. Um, but if, you know, you buy it from somebody that, you know, you don't have, doesn't have a reputation, doesn't stand behind their work, then you're hoping that they did a good job. Right. Yeah. And and that's tough, right? How would you recommend somebody just look at a, look at a grip and know if it's going to fit them right? Is it pretty self-explanatory? Ah, not always. Um, I think a lot of folks, um, get stuff because it looks cool Mm -hmm. and they see stuff and they think, well, the first thing people always ask is, is something grippy? And I'm like, that's Grippy. just, that's, yeah, but like that, that's not that important. Like it, it's important. Don't get me wrong, but it's like, that is like towards the end 
of my list of things to consider because if it's really grippy but not ergonomic, I'm not going to be I'm not going to be accurate with my cuts. I'm going to start slipping when I get hand fatigue. I'm going to start making mistakes. I'm going to do bad stuff that either hurts my animal or hurts me. And um, I, I want something that's going to be ergonomic that's going to give me control, not just when I'm starting, but when I'm at the end of skinning that elk or bison or the 15th deer that week, because I'm the guy that skins deer in deer camp and everybody's just killing it on gun week. Um, I want a knife that's going to let me keep up and, Mm -hmm. you know, stay accurate with my cuts. Uh, The other thing is, I mean, again, there's nothing wrong with being grippy, but some folks get so wrapped up in the idea of something being grippy that they get something that later on they don't actually care for. And if you don't like the knife, you're not going to carry the knife. And I don't know. I, I think that like people get so wrapped up in it being grippy. The animal's already dead. You're working on dead animals. At least I hope so. Um, and yeah, like, no it's kidding. not, it's not pumping blood out everywhere all over you. If you've done, if the animal's dead, it's, and it's been killed by a hunter, you know, like it's been, it's, it's died through bleeding out. Um, it's largely bloodless. Um, there's nothing on earth that's still grippy through fat. I mean, fat is always slick. It's like motor oil Yeah, blood though. It's not bleeding whenever you're working on it. So there's not much of an issue there other than gutting the animal. Um, I would focus mostly on ergonomics. That's my big thing. The other thing is knives that have the tang sticking out on the edges. Um, so, you know, full tang knife, the tang is mm-hmm. exposed all the way around. A lot of guys get knives that have the, the scales are CNC machined and they're smaller in profile than the tang. And so the tang sticks out all the way around the edge. Yeah. And it looks kind of cool, looks kind of tactical, but then that wears hot spots in your hand, something fierce. And you're blistered up and everything by the time you get done through, you know, working mm-hmm. one or two animals down. What materials do you like for your handles? Oh, that's a huge rabbit hole. Um, <laughs> I work with all kinds of stuff. I've got carbon fiber. I like, so for my customers tend to like my Carta stuff because my card is ergonomic. It looks pretty cool. Um, there's stuff called G Carta. It's made in Nampa, Idaho. Uh, by a guy named Greg Hansen. He makes um, composites that are, it's like micarta, but instead of being industrial and made, he industrially, oh, tongue tied. It's small batches of fabric that are rolled up with resin and pressed into blocks and then cut whenever it's hardened. So you get a lot of cool patterns and colors. Oh, yeah. Um, and he's got a, a zillion different color combos. And he's always dropping new stuff. It's pretty cool. Um, I work with stabilized woods. That's woods that have been soaked in resin um, using a vacuum process to draw it all the way through. Mm-hmm. Um, ivory, antler, everybody likes antler. Uh, as far as me personally, I'm a huge fan of antique micartas. So uh, micarta is an industrial material. It's made for usually electrical work to insulate, you know, transformers and stuff. Okay. And when it gets old, it oxidizes. So it gets darker. It might be like a honey blonde color to start off. And then in 50 years, it's developed this dark brown, we call it bark, uh, on the surface. And when you cut through it, you can see the oxidation layers just like fading into the honey brown on the inside. And it makes for a really cool handle. And it's just special. Like I, I'm making a knife right now out of some that's from the Boeing plant in Tacoma, Washington. Oh, sweet. And it's, it's like super old stuff. And like they're not making anymore, you know, and it's mm-hmm. like it's got a backstory. It's got a place it came from. And it's like stuff like that gets me fired up, but oh, I, I, I can make a handle out of just about anything. Really, Is there, yeah. yeah, yeah. And that is that more, when you're choosing your handle, is that more of a, just a personal preference thing over, are there, you know, besides maybe like care? Well, there, there is some care with some materials. Like I said, ivory, yeah. um, elk antler, bone, um, some woods, like you don't want to like, like get it wet, wipe it off, and then just throw it you know, in the drawer for next year. You want to oil it and you know, keep it hydrated so it stays pretty mm-hmm. and stays, you know, from shrinking and stuff. Um, there's other materials, like I said, carbon fiber and G10 that don't need any care whatsoever. And yeah. they're bulletproof. They're really tough stuff. Actually, I didn't mention, um, I've got the stuff called Sure Touch. And I don't know if it'll show up. Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah. But it's G10 and rubber layers. Those layers you see that are black are rubber. Whoa. So it's absurdly grippy <laughs> going back to the grippy thing is grippy yeah. without without giving up stuff like you don't have little grooves and crevices and checkering to pick up fat and blood um and to stink later on it's not porous mm-hmm. like wood so it's not going to pick up like you know you have that shore lunch um you get your three-day fishing license when you're hunting out west and you catch some trout now your knife smells like trout for the next six months and it doesn't happen with that stuff 
Nice. That's that's super interesting stuff, sounds like. Uh, let's go into field sharpening. This was, people really wanted to hear about this. This was like the one thing. And man, <laughs> we when we were doing the meat eater stuff, we, we had the work sharp guys on and we talked about sh- knife sharpening. And I mean, we got more comments on that episode than any of the other ones we did. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I got... I uh, I don't have any great recommendations for field sharpening because yeah. it's gonna sound like I'm bragging myself up. I haven't mm-hmm. had to sharpen in the field really. Like I, I right. tend to I, I choose knives that I don't have to sharpen in the field. You know, if I work down an elk, I've still got life left on my edge and I can help my buddy mm-hmm. with his. Um, I do like to bring a little micro pocket stone. Um, it's about the size of a pack of gum or a stick of gum. Um, I want to say Easy Lap makes it. Um, hmm. and it's an extra fine diamond stone. It works on any steel. I mean, even carbide, it'll sharpen. And, um, I bring that and then I'll bring, and this is like something you can't find at a knife shop or sporting goods store. But if you go to a machine shop and ask them for a drill blank, that's just hardened drill bit rod without any flutes in it and get one that's like four inches long, like eh, three sixteenths or so in diameter, it's hardened. So your knife can't bite into it. And you can use it like mm-hmm. a chef's deal. Like you see people using the movies. Yeah. And when you're skinning out, like caping out a head and you're, you, you brush up against the bone with your edge or your tooth, you know, tooth yeah. with your edge, teeth, teeth are harder than steel. And what that causes is um, it rolls the edge. You can't see it. It's on a microscopic level, but suddenly it won't cut. And with that hardened drill blank, you can couple strokes and it's not removing any metal. It's just standing that edge back up. And now it cuts like crazy again. Hmm. So with a good steel, you shouldn't have to sharpen in the field. You might have to fix rolls, but you shouldn't have to sharpen. Okay. What about what about at home when you do have to sharpen? At home, so um, there's a couple different methods that are cool. There's the KME benchtop style. Like I, there's a bunch of different companies that make them now. I think WorkSharp makes one now too. Mm-hmm. But it mounts to your tabletop, has a little chip clip that grabs onto your knife and holds it flat. Eh, I got a knife here. It holds it flat, and then there's a guide rod system with a stone on a stick and you just run it across the knife and it's impossible to mess your angle up once it's set. Um, those anybody can make a knife scream and sharp with that system. And it's not like hogging down your edge in a weird spot. It's not doing anything that you can mess up. They're great. They're, they take up a little more space. They're a little more expensive, but they're really worth the money. If you ask me. Um, and they work on any knife. You can set the angles. Another one is the, the Ken onion work sharp which is mm-hmm. a tabletop. It's motorized, has a little belt. Um, but I, if anybody gets one of those, I would advise that when you buy one, you go to the sporting goods counter at the store you're buying it at and buy off the turnstile one of those super cheap piece of crap pocket knives from China. Yeah. Get one of those and practice on that like crazy before you put your good knives on it because it's easy to like round the tip off or hog out the belly right by the handle. Um, it's easy to go too far with those. So get some practice in. Yeah, yeah, got it. Uh, with those, with, I mean, even like those home style sharpeners are a little uh, more expensive, but they're still like 60 bucks. Like they're not yeah. like 200. Um, yeah. so yeah. So after we got one of those and I was touching my knives up, like we just started touching like steak knives up and stuff and that, that are in the house and like, what a difference it makes. Oh yeah. Well, I tell everybody that like, you know, you buy a vehicle and you don't stop thinking about like changing your oil or getting new tires. Like those are things you think about. You get a rifle, you think about cleaning it afterwards. You think about checking your zero. And so many people are like, I've had that knife for 10 years and it doesn't cut anymore, but I got to find somebody to sharpen it. Like, dude, you should learn how to sharpen. Like that's like, you don't hire people to like mop your floors. Like just do it. Yeah. Yeah. Like buy the equipment and do it. And it works forever. Your sharpening system is good for a very long time. And if you wear it out, and you're living a much more exciting life than I'm living <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because dang. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. Um, anything else you you can think of that you want to dig into? Oh man. I mean, like it just depends on how crazy you want to get. Uh, so I, like uh, my little side project that I've been working on has been, um, it's called hog dogging. It's running hogs and hounds yeah. down in Texas. And uh, because you're running hounds and the hounds are actually catching the pig, right. um, unlike running, you know, hounds for cats or for bears, you can't shoot them because, you know, you, yeah. obviously you've got a dog fighting, dogs. You know, like grabbing mm-hmm. onto his face and stuff. 
And so you get in there with a knife and you, you know, one hand's on the pig, the other hand's on your knife and you take care of business that way. Yeah. And so I've actually, I've been working on a, uh, a pig sticker design oh, for dear. doing just that. And, uh, it's been wild. I, uh, I went down and did some testing uh, when I was on an exotics hunt last, I think it was November in Texas and it worked out pretty well. I did some did some fine you know, tunings and tweaks mm-hmm. on the, the design. And then after that, I think it was in February or March, I went back down with some buddies. We all had that, you know, the refined version of the knife model. It's called the Harpy. And uh, we cleaned house on pigs. It was epic. And actually, I'm going to be going back here in, uh, I want to say it's February, this this coming mm-hmm. February, to do it again. It's been, nice. it's crazy. If you haven't done it, it's a lot of fun. It's It's worth trying. Yeah, yeah, I did it once. Just the soft heart of me is like, it's primal. <laughs> it's pretty primal. It is, a, it is really primal. I mean, at the same yeah. time, if you do it, if if you make a good stick, and with proper technique, it's a it's quicker than an arrow kill. But the really? idea of like being hands on is it's a bit much for some folks. It is, yeah, 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 yeah it is. Um, dude, that's awesome. What are what are the wait times? What are your lead times currently for customs? So to get a custom, if you get on my wait list right now, it's around eight months. Um, it could mm-hmm. be a little more, it could be a little less. It fluctuates, but it's been riding about eight, nine months for the last three years. So it's nice. pretty safe to say it's around there. Um, like I said, you can also follow me on Instagram or Facebook and I post yeah. open sale stuff, usually on my story. So um, I'll have, you know, like the available post. And if you tap on it, you can look at the actual post and see all the specs. Mm-hmm. But if you have any questions, just shoot me a message, you know. Um, I try to do one or two fancy open sales a week, and then I'll do, like I said, the stock options now with the Meadowlark and the Magpie. So yeah, somebody wants to buy something right before a hunt, awesome. or they've got, uh, you know, a relative or a friend that's going to go on a hunt that's, you know, they got a cool tag draw and they want to get them something. Um, you know, that's a great option to get. Yeah. Have you started doing etchings or engravings? Uh, not, I'm not doing custom engravings right now. Like I just engraved my logo and, um, yeah. in some weird cases I do serial numbers. Um, the, the etching process I use isn't really conducive to being economical for doing yeah. custom engravings. Uh, I do plan on at some point getting a fiber laser and, and doing that, but it's, it's not in the cards at the moment. Right. Gotcha. All right. Well, where's the best place that folks can get a hold of you? So they can shoot me an email or call me. Uh, my my email is uh, uh, Simbita Custom Knives. I'm assuming we'll, we could put that in the tagline or the yeah, info yeah. for the podcast. Um, my number is 740-270-9057. And you can give me a call or shoot me a text anytime. Um, as long as I'm not like in the mountains and don't have signal, I'll answer the phone. Yeah. And uh, then Instagram or Facebook. Um, that's pretty much where I do like 95% of my work is on Instagram and Facebook. Yeah. Awesome, man. Well, thanks again for hopping on, Evan. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode of Jordan's Toolkit. If you have any questions or suggestions for future episodes, please visit the website, jordan-bud.com, and follow the links to submit an email or voicemail to be played on air. If you're listening on an audio platform, you can also watch this podcast on YouTube via Jordan Bud's personal channel.